bit chilly. Davey's here. How are you this morning? Grace and peace to you, church, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship with Amity, both here and online. It is good to gather with you all. First, lots of announcements today. First, I want to say, yes, it is chilly in here. <laughs> the heat has decided to take the morning off, but we're working on it. Um, so bundle up, snuggle close, and um, seek the warmth of the Spirit of God, right? <laughs> God will be with us, and we will stay warm. Um, I want to draw your attention to a couple things. There's, on the back of your bulletin, you will see a note about um, decorating for Advent, which begins next Sunday. So come on Saturday morning if you are available, 10 o'clock. They'll be decorating in here and then down in Johnson Hall as well. We need as many folks as we can um, to get this space looking beautiful for the season. And um, let's see, a couple um, 
announcements from our finance ministry first. Today is we are collecting a 10 cents a meal offering. You'll see that envelope in your bulletin. That goes to serve youth, at-risk youth and hungry folks here in our presbytery. So that's a dedicated offering you are invited to give generously to. Um, as well as, I want to say, if you have not turned in your giving pledge for 2024, please do so. Um, our finance ministry team is going to be working on next year's budget over the next couple weeks, and that helps us plan and be faithful stewards of God's gift. So if you have not done that yet and are planning to, please go ahead. You can place it in the offering, in the office, whatever works best for you. Also, a little reminder from Ella Sue, our, uh, one of our faithful finance people. Tuesday, you know, there's Black Friday and then Cyber Monday and then all these days, right? Thank you, Neil. Giving Tuesday is Tuesday. And that is the day where you're supposed to give to organizations and, and ministries doing good work in the world. Amity can be one of those. So I invite you to consider giving to Amity on Giving Tuesday. Um, let me see. You'll also see on the back of your, prayer, of your bulletin the Amity prayer needs. I want to add a name to that list. Uh, Nancy Drummond is in the hospital right now undergoing some cancer treatment, and she has asked for prayer. Nancy Drummond. Um, so please keep her in your prayers as well. And we have two more. <laughs> Youth group, Amity's new youth group is starting up next week. Yay, Tate's clapping in the back. Tate is our director of, of um, youth outreach and discipleship for middle and high school youth starting next Sunday, first and third Sundays at 415. Tell your friends, tell your neighbors, we need volunteers, adult volunteers to help with that, and kids to come. So one final announcement, I'm going to invite Isaiah to... Share loudly, I'll see your mic, so. Our hymnals are here! Yay, Yay. new hymnals! <laughs> so that we can come through them. They are gorgeous. I think you made a great choice with the purple and the silver. Um, I don't know what, what you call whenever you paint the text on. and it's Emboss? Embossing. I think. Wonderful word. <laughs> um, so feel free to look through. I am now in the process of printing the dedication labels that will be in the front of them, and the hope is that we will start using them in January after we dedicate them to this church. So, here we'll you use go. Them soon. All right. Thank you all so much for giving so generously. We surpassed our pie in the sky goal that we set of 100. Mm -hmm. So, we're getting 120. 125 or 120 is 120. what we're getting. So, praise the Lord. God is good. Thank you all so much. Okay, that was a lot of announcements. <laughs> all good things, all good things that are the way that we are the church in this place. So now, let's settle our hearts and minds as we turn to God in prayer to begin worship. Join me in prayer. God of the lost and lonely, God of the secure and confident, gather us into your fold that we may be healed and transformed this time of worship, shine the light within and among us. Guide us in our living, that we may be part of ministries of healing and hope. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, let's rise and call one another to worship. The words in your bulletin. Make a joyful noise to God. Worship, worship God, God with gladness. gladness. Come into God's presence with a song. No, no, the Lord is God. God made us, we belong to God. Give thanks, thanks to God. God. Bless, Bless the name of the Lord. All right, church, the louder you sing, the warmer it gets in here. Let's sing hymn number 460. Holy God, we praise your name.
Beloved, Christ rules over us all. Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is the same Christ that came to be with us, to laugh with us, to cry with us, to break bread with us, to be one of us. We can approach Christ with boldness, knowing that Christ will hear our confession and that Christ offers us grace. So church, let's sing our prayer of confession and then pray together in words and then in silence. Let us pray. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have given you food. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would have taken you in. If we had known it was you, Lord, we would not have passed you by. But we did. Too often we make excuses for not taking care of each other. We have ignored your commandments to love and care. Humbly we ask for your forgiveness and ask you to help us change our ways. Amen. Beloveds, God seeks the lost. God brings back those who have wandered. God binds up the wounded. And God sets us by nourishing waters of grace. Drink, be filled be redeemed. Friends, let's speak of God's good, good grace. In hear and believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. I'll invite the children who are here this morning to come on up as we sing Jesus Loves Me.
Yeah, hey. It is good to be here with you. With you who are church family. And all these people, we are all part of God's family, of Jesus' family. Jesus calls us all siblings. Did you know that? Brothers? Uh Uh-huh. You're his sheep and his siblings. Yes. I know. It's a little confusing. Uh Uh-huh. Well, here, let me tell you. Jesus talked about a shepherd, a shepherd king today in our scripture. Hold on one second. Let me tell you about the scripture first, okay? And then you can ask your question. All right? Jesus gathered his disciples to tell them how he knows that they are his family, his siblings, and his sheep. He says, in the last days, in the end of things, there's a king who sits on the throne. And he says, there are sheep and there are goats. Isn't that funny? There's sheep and there's goats. Do you like goats? Goats are kind of cool. They're funny, right? Nothing wrong with goats, okay? Let me, hear you, let me say that about this first. There's nothing wrong with goats. <laughs> God made goats too. And he says there's sheep and there are goats. And on this side of the king on the throne, I put sheep, who I call friends. And on this side, I put the goats. Hmm. So there's something different about the sheep and the goats. <laughs> now, this is, we got to use our imaginations, right? Because do we look like sheep and goats? No. He was, Jesus was talking about people. Mm-hmm. And he said, some are like sheep and some are like goats. Sheep and goats. Now, he says, here is how I know the sheep. He says, I know the sheep because they fed me when I was hungry. This is the King Jesus talking. He says, they fed me when I was hungry, and they gave me clothes when I didn't have any, and they visited me when I was in prison, and they cared for me when I was sick. That's how I know that these are my sheep, my family. Oh, and they gave him something to drink when he was thirsty. Right. Thanks, Neil. And do you know what the sheep said? The sheep people? (laughs) They said, We don't remember doing that, Jesus. We didn't do that to you. You were never hungry or thirsty or sick or in prison or naked. We didn't do that for you. And he was like, well, here's what you need to know, sheep. (laughs) He said, when you feed and clothe and visit and care for the least of these, that's a phrase we use sometimes, to talk about people in the world who need help, who are vulnerable, people who are sick, people who are hungry and thirsty, people who are in prison and they're lonely, right? Jesus said, when you care for them, then you've cared for me. That is how I know that you are my sheep. And he says, the goats, the goats don't do any of those things. Right? He said, you didn't do those things, so you didn't do those things for me because you didn't care for other people. And that's how I know who my family is because, because I love them, they love the world. Now, I see your question, June. I'm coming to you. Have you or anybody always helped somebody that you saw in need? Like every time. Have you done it every time? No. That's really hard, right? Now, do you ignore everybody that's in need? Have you ever helped anybody? Yes. Yeah, you do. All of us are kind of like geep. (laughs) Or, yeah, geep. Or (laughs) shots. Sometimes we're sheep, and sometimes we're goats. And some parts of us are one or the other. And we do our best, right? And so Jesus was saying, he said, I know my family because they help each other. So that is how we show the world that God loves us and that God loves them, is that we do our best. And we're not going to get it right. It's not 100% all the time. Because guess what? God loves us. Jesus loves us no matter what. Jesus loves us anyway and forgives us when we mess up and helps us do better. Do you still have a question, June? 
Mm hmm. Hey, bud. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Maybe. That's a good question, Jean. Let's talk some more about that. We, we believe that God made the whole world, right? And all the creatures in it. And we are a part of those creatures, right? So even the animals are our siblings in some way. They're a part of creation. Yeah. I love it that you asked that while wearing your ears, your animal ears. <laughs> It's a good reminder, Jean. Thank you for that. Okay, so how you help others really, really matters. Okay? That's how the world knows that we are Christians. Okay? And I know that you guys know that because I've seen you help and care for other people. You guys are really good at that. And sometimes you remind the grown-ups how we're supposed to do it. Because you're a little bit better at it sometimes. You know that? Yeah. yeah. You can lead us. All right? So let's say a prayer. Okay? You can repeat after me. Oh, dear God, keep showing us how to love each other better. Give us the courage to help those in need and to accept the help when we need it too. In Jesus' name we pray. Mm-hmm. Amen. <laughs> Thank you all for joining me. You can go to the playground at the back and worship from there, okay? Keep your ears open and listen and worship. first scripture this morning is Psalm 100. Listen for God's word for, to us today. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. We turn from that psalm of praise to our gospel lesson today. We hear the words of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 to 46. And this passage is the close of the Sermon on the Mount. So listen again for God's word to us. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a sheep separates, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or need, needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? And the king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed 
into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Friends, this is the word of God, and it is for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 2014, St. Albans Episcopal Church, just up the road in Davidson, North Carolina, installed a bronze sculpture in front of their church. It was in memory of a church member who had always loved public art. And St. Albans sits in a busy and wealthy residential area, and it sits at the entrance to what you would call a high-end kind of neighborhood. Big, expensive houses. The sculpture appears to be a simple wooden park bench. You can see it on your bulletin cover. And on this bench lies a sleeping person, huddled under a blanket with only their bare feet and a bit of their hair visible. And at first glance, anyone would assume that this is a real person, homeless, sleeping. But it's only when you get close enough to be seen by this sleeping person yourself that you can see that it's a sculpture. And only then will you notice the exposed feet of the huddled human bear the crucifixion wounds of Christ. A few feet away, a plaque bears the inscription, Jesus the Homeless. The sculptor, Timothy Schmalz, describes it as a visual translation of the gospel reading that we just heard, where Jesus identifies himself with the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, the prisoner, and then he tells his followers, whatever you did to one of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And this sculpture in Davidson was the first to be installed in the United States. But now there are 14 Jesus the Homeless sculptures around the world, even in Rome. It's not at all surprising that the reactions to this statue and these statues vary widely. Some people find it offensive. It is offensive to portray the savior of the world like that. Others adore it. Pope Francis has blessed one of them himself. The bench is always made just long enough for one person to sit down by Jesus' feet. And up in Davidson, it's not uncommon now to see someone sitting in prayer, resting their hand on Jesus' feet. But it was also up in Davidson that a woman called the police to make a report within minutes of the sculpture's installation, assuming that the figure beneath the blanket was a real homeless person sleeping at the entrance to her neighborhood. Still 10 years later, the police and the church, they get calls from unaware people who are concerned about the person on the bench. Concerned for them, maybe. Concerned about their presence, maybe. But the church there, that congregation, they are not worried about the controversy or the double takes that they get. The pastor of the church at that time said, this is a relatively affluent church, and to be honest, we need to be reminded ourselves that our faith expresses itself in active concern for the marginalized of society. 
It's a good Bible lesson, he said. For those used to seeing Jesus depicted in traditional religious arts as the Christ of glory, enthroned in finery. Mm. Good art makes you think. Today, the church celebrates Christ the King Sunday. It's the final Sunday of the church year, the liturgical year, before a new church year begins next week with the first Sunday of Advent. And the intent of this day is that we pause before launching into a new season and a new year and we reflect on the meaning of Christ's reign. Christ's reign over the church, over the world, the cosmos, over our lives. We ask the question, what kind of king is Jesus? What does his rule look like? What does it feel like? What does it mean to live under his kingship? And you'd be right to expect pomp and pageantry on this Sunday. A lot of churches lean all the way in. That's often what you find. Churches, Christians, we like to focus on the power of the cosmic Christ who reigns in ultimate glory, ultimate power. We look to the Christ of Revelation who's ushered in a new heaven and a new earth upon whom hangs the salvation and the redemption of all creation. It's meant to give us hope. Hope that ultimately all will be made well. Because the one who spoke the world into existence in the first place, the one who loves the world, the one who loves the world enough to live and die for it, that is the same one who sits on the throne of grace. This is the Sunday, Christ the King Sunday, where we say, take heart, church. Because God is bigger than the brokenness and the division of this life, and all will be made right in the end. And yet, and yet, for Christ the King Sunday, I didn't pick this scripture. This is the lectionary, the schedule, the calendar of scriptures. This is the passage that the lectionary gives us. These words of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew, we might expect triumphant, transfigured, resurrected Jesus at least. But what we find is homeless Jesus, sick Jesus, hungry Jesus, naked Jesus, imprisoned Jesus. Here we find who the Episcopal theologian Fleming Rutledge calls the royalty that stoops. The king who stoops. Now, don't get me wrong. What we do have here is still a passage about the end. When we read the whole passage, Jesus is calling his disciples to take seriously what it will be like when God's people ultimately stand before the king on his throne. And somehow... The part about the least of these has become almost a, a comfortable cliché for Christians. It, it's become something that we are quick to call on to affirm our own good deeds, but also to condemn the action or inaction of someone that we disagree with. We throw the least of these verse at them. I'd say a lot of us would rather not focus at all on this bit about the sheep and the goats being separated into designations of eternal punishment or eternal life. Whew, that's a rough one. But, church, as Matthew tells it, this is Jesus' final teaching before the Passion, before he heads to the cross. These are the words that Jesus wants ringing in our ears as he takes his leave of us. They are tough, intimidating, daunting words from the mouth of Jesus. They seem to be more the language of fire and brimstone preachers 
Some of you may like those more than I do. <laughs> but it seems to be that kind of language versus the, the humble, suffering, gracious Savior. But according to Holy Scripture, these are his words nonetheless. And with them, Jesus seems to be attempting to make clear that, that our acts of mercy and compassion here and now, they do have cosmic ramifications. How we live, how we choose to treat one another now makes eternal ripples through the kingdom of heaven. And these things are not secondary. They are not an afterthought. They are primary. They are of utmost importance. It's interesting that in his last teaching to the disciples, at least as Matthew presents it, Jesus doesn't say anything about creed or right belief as the determining factor between these so-called sheep and goats. The shepherd king calls his sheep to him to inherit the kingdom that was prepared for them before the creation of the world. He calls them to himself to receive the blessing that God had already planned to give them. And he says, I know that you are my sheep because you had mercy on me when you had mercy on others. Their acts of mercy toward the least of these didn't earn them God's blessing. They revealed it. God's blessing came first. According to Jesus, God's blessing was already given. But when they lived and acted with compassion and mercy, God's blessing was revealed. And it seems that works of love and mercy, they are the fruit of God's saving grace, not the root of it. They don't earn us God's grace. God's grace makes compassion possible in our lives. And nowhere does Jesus say, my sheep are the ones who claim correct doctrine. My sheep are the ones who get scripture right. They understand it perfectly. Nowhere does he say, my sheep belong to this church and the goats belong to that one. Nor does he say, my sheep are the ones who make faith in me the law of the land or use my name to hold power over others or force others to conform to believing in me. There's nothing here, church, about worldly, triumphant Christian victory. Here, the shepherd king, the suffering savior, points only to acts of compassion given or withheld. Hmm. <sighs> Theologian Debbie Thomas, she says, I just, I got to read you her words. I fear, she says, I fear that instead of embracing the countercultural possibility of a humble and wounded king, we've given ourselves over to a version of kingship that's all about domination, about supremacy, about triumphalism and greatness. We've fallen in love with the loud, the muscular, the aggressive. And we have forgotten that the only power Jesus wielded on earth was the power to give himself away. He is the king who entered humanity red-faced and crying, a king whose greatest displays of power included riding on a donkey, washing dirty feet, hanging on a cross, and frying fish on the beach with his friends. How did we go 
from this God who empties himself of all privilege, the God who perpetually pours himself out and surrenders his own life for his loved ones to God as Iron Man. Living in a wounded world, living in a broken world as we do, it's not at all surprising, church. It's not at all surprising that so many of us long for a clear and an easy way to fix things. And we think, well, if we believe that Christ can fix things, then surely we should want Christ seated in our own halls of power and might. This isn't surprising. This makes sense that we long for this. How often do we hear the refrain, things would not be as bad as they are today if we would just put God back in school, yeah, government, people's hearts, families, right? Fill in the blank. We're so tempted to think that if people just believed correctly about God, then society would fix itself. As if we humans could ever keep God away from somewhere that God wants to be. God is already present in all those places, church. Jesus, the living word, has always been present in all of those places. Maybe what is missing are the people of God living our lives as though we actually trust what Jesus says. That offering grace and mercy, compassion and care to others, that is actually what reveals the kingdom of God. That is what helps people see and experience the love of God and helps the world be transformed. We don't trust that because it's scary. We don't trust it. So we try to force and legislate God's kingdom into being. That's what we know. We're humans. That's what we do. And this isn't one side or the other, any kind of political thing. We all do this, right? That's what we know as people. And Jesus knows that about us. The same was true for his disciples and the world back then. So he prepares his disciples for the day that he knows is coming when they will no longer see him in the flesh before him by telling them where he can be found. He tells them where you can find me. So many of us, we long to see Jesus. We want to know Jesus more and more. We sing, we pray, we study, we worship, hoping for a deeper experience of the presence of Christ. We want to feel him close to us, present in our lives. There's nothing wrong with that. These are good, important, life-giving practices. Unless they keep us at a safe distance from where Jesus has told us he is. Unless they relegate the work of justice and mercy into the background because we've convinced ourselves that what's in our hearts and our minds is what matters the most for Christians. What we think, what we believe, matters more than acts of compassion. Church, what does it mean to be a Christian if not to follow Christ? And where is Jesus? Jesus is in the least, in the lost, the broken, and the wounded. Jesus is in the ugly, dirty places, in the bodies that we don't discuss in polite company. 
He's in the faces that we don't smile at and the eyes we avoid. He's in the prison cells with the forgotten, the abandoned. He's in the ones who make us uncomfortable, the ones we don't understand. He's in the parts of town that we speed by. This is where we find Christ the King who stoops. Christ the King who surrenders himself to the point that he's not just with the vulnerable. He is the vulnerable. If we want to see Jesus more, if we want to experience his presence more and more in our lives right now, we must go to where Jesus is, church. According to these words of Jesus himself, there is no other way Jesus is found in the least of these. Next Sunday, Advent begins. We turn from from longing toward longing, toward preparing an expectation for the Savior's entrance into the world as a vulnerable, helpless infant. Something so unexpected, so upside down, so counter to what we know about the world. Our worship series for Advent, it's, it's called... It's very timely, I think. It's called, How Does a Weary World Rejoice? That's our theme for the season. I don't know about you, but I've been feeling some of that weariness in the world. This series calls us deeper into this tension that we're living, this tension between the weary world and the one that has come to make all things new. Deeper into trusting God's unexpected, upside-down ways in the world and trusting God's invitation to come and see the shepherd king, the one whose story began in a manger, and to rejoice in the presence of God with us even when the world seems as weary as it has ever been. We long to see Jesus. We don't have to wait, church. We don't have to wait to see Jesus. Jesus is with us. And Jesus is with the least of these. We don't have to wait until the end of things to rejoice. We can see Jesus now. We can rejoice now. Singing our faith as we live it out in acts of compassion. What if when we sing this gospel hymn, soon and very soon, soon and very soon, no more crying there, no more dying there, we're going to see the King. What if that song becomes less of a longing to escape the sorrows of the world. And it becomes more of a promise. A promise to the ones who are crying now. The ones who are dying now. A promise that we are coming to them. We are coming to find them. What if when we sing soon and very soon, we are going to see the king? We mean that we are on our way to wipe the tears and heal the wounds of Jesus because we have seen them in the least of these. Imagine a world where Jesus' followers heed Jesus' words. He asks us to see him in places we'd rather not look. To remember that every encounter that we have with the least of these is an actual encounter with our shepherd king. It's not a metaphor. (laughs) It's not a play on words. It doesn't seem to be optional, church. 
the person huddled beneath the blankets is our king. Let's go and see him. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Church, let's pray for this weary world, shall we? Lord our God, we certainly are not always sheep. <laughs> and we thank you that you do not condemn us <laughs> to the realm of the goats. We carry goodness and evil within us. And you meet us with grace. So, Lord, we pray that you would give your church, your people, the courage to live out your commands, your invitation to meet you in the faces of the least of these. Lord, we pray for this world, for the earth that bears scars and open wounds for your people living in violence, rocked by conflict and war. We pray for our siblings in Palestine and Israel. We pray for our siblings in places like Russia and Ukraine, in places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in so many places. Lord, we pray for healing, for peace. We pray for the day when all the earth will make a joyful noise to the one who made them. Lord, we pray for your church that we would truly become the body of Christ in the world. That we would see your face in one another. That those who are lost, those who are despairing, those who are lonely, those who are sick, those who are abused, those who harm others, those who are harmed. Lord, bring healing. Send us and heal us. Lord, we lift to you the names of people in this church and in our community and people that are on our hearts today. This is one way, Lord, that we know that you are present with us and with them. And so we speak their names to you and to one another, either out loud or in the sanctuary of our hearts. Either way, Lord, give us the names, the names that we need to carry to you in prayer. Lord, there is so much weariness and woundedness. But there is so much grace and so much healing. We pray for our community, for our neighbors. Lord, teach us to see Christ in them. Lord, 
Teach us to trust your promise that acts of compassion and mercy really do matter and they do change the world. Give us courage and hear us as we pray the prayer that Jesus gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Giving on our hearts, let us remember that we have the opportunity to joyfully share what God has provided. With the gifts we offer, God grows the ministries of justice and hope here at Amity that help us love and serve our neighbors. You can give to God through our church website or in the offering plates at the front of the back doors of the sanctuary as we worship today. May all that we offer today be given to the glory of God. Now let's rise and sing soon and very soon. You can find that music in the insert in the bulletin. of God go into the world hearing the cries of the least of these and the invitation to new family new siblings in Christ hear the call and respond because soon and very soon we are going to see the king who awaits in the eyes of the least of these Go out and love and serve the world in the name of Jesus Christ, who sends us in his love and grace. Go in peace, church, but let's sing our amen. <laughs>
go in peace.